I know it's even better, isn't it? There I am. Come on now. All right. Well, again, certainly good to see you this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to fill in the pulpit in Brother George's absence. And certainly, again, want to be praying for our pastor. Uh, you know what? He has a tough job being the pastor of a congregation, uh, but he's always well prepared. He always seeks the Lord and the message that the Lord would have him to deliver to us. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for a man who has a heart for the Lord, and that shows forth in his action and his character and his love for us. So uh, don't ever take it for granted what we have in Brother George and our pastor. So uh, it's just a blessing to have him and Sister Lisa as well. Well, this morning I'm going to preach a message entitled Negotiating with God. Negotiating with God. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And while you're finding your place there, we know that Paul wrote the book of Romans to the church at Rome, made up primarily of the Gentiles, the gospel being offered first to the Jews, then also the Gentiles. As we come to Romans chapter 11, we understand that many Jews had not yet accepted Christ, and uh, so it was opened up to the Gentiles. Yet, we know that the Jews are God's chosen people, and they're reminded of that. Romans is one of the longest epistles written by Paul. And as he writes this, he tells us a lot about the doctrine of salvation. And as we consider negotiating with God, I wonder this morning who would say, you know what, I'm a pretty good negotiator. I'm a pretty good negotiator. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, you know what, I don't ever negotiate. I don't do those things. But the reality is we all are negotiators. In one way or another, we're all negotiators, and we have all find ourselves in that position of negotiation. You see, negotiation is nothing more than just trying to reach an agreement with someone. On the political scene, we hear about Trump's negotiations with China over the trade deal. In our personal life, we've all negotiated. If you've ever went to purchase a new car or do something, you don't walk on the lot and see the sticker price and say, great, I'll pay it. Can I give you some extra? No, what you do is you negotiate that. So you negotiate that. You try to say, hey, can I get a better deal on this vehicle or otherwise? And friends, oftentimes we negotiate. We say, you know what? If you'll do this, then I'll do this over here. So we have that negotiation that takes place there. Siblings often negotiate. If you let me ride in the front seat, both going and coming, then when we get there, I'll let you play the machine longer or do whatever it is that the task at hand that they want to do. We often negotiate with our spouse, don't we? Trying to come to an agreement. The thing we negotiate most about is where we're going to eat. So you get in the car and you say, where are we eating? I don't care where you want to eat. I don't care where you want to eat. Just name a place. All right, I'll name a place. I don't want to eat there. <laughs> so why didn't you just pick to start with? It would have been a lot easier, right? We negotiate there. We negotiate with our kids. We say, if you'll eat your dinner, then I'll give you ice cream. If you'll do good in school, then I'll give you this reward for that. If you've ever gone to someone's house and you say, look... I'm going to negotiate with you. When you get there, you better be on your best behavior. One time, Casey's not here so I can use this example, we went over to the Adams house for dinner and we said, boys, no matter what, no matter what they have, you just tell them you like it. Tell them you're thankful for it. Just be on your best behavior. So we finished eating and we got around there and Logan went to Miss Casey and he said, Miss Casey, I just want to tell you, I love burnt chicken. Thank you for fixing that. <laughs> he was honest. He was honest. But even our kids at a young age, they start negotiating. They start negotiating. We say, you know what? Now is your bedtime. Five more minutes. Can I stay up just five more minutes? Or perhaps they get in the bed and they say, you know what? Now I'm thirsty. So I need to get up and go get a drink. Now that I've gotten a drink, I need to use the bathroom. So all the time they're negotiating back and forth. Even if you look at negotiation, I mean, there's tons of information out there on the art of negotiation. You can find all kinds of information, all kinds of seminars, all kinds of tips on how to be a good negotiator. One such thing said these are the five steps to becoming a great negotiator. Number one, you want to establish a relationship. Number two, you want to choose honey over vinegar, that is kind of sweeten them up, sweet talk them as you're going through. Number three, focus on the win-win. Consider both parties have something to gain. Don't argue or provoke and respect the rhythm of the relationship. But can I tell you, if we're not careful, negotiation can look an awful lot like manipulation. Negotiation can look an awful lot 
like manipulation, an attempt to control or influence a person or a situation cleverly or unfairly. Sometimes we get so good at negotiating. Sometimes we get so skillful in thinking, you know what, I just need to reach an agreement here. We need to work together to reach this agreement that it spills over into our relationship with the Lord. And I want to tell you this morning, when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no negotiation. There is no negotiation. And as we look this morning in Romans chapter 11, we're going to look at three verses of Scripture. Romans chapter 11, verses 33, 34, 35, 36. I'm sorry, four verses of Scripture. I did go to school. Four verses of Scripture. So if you look at that, what does it say there? In verse 33, it says this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. As we look at verse 36, we see this. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. That is, God is the source of all things. God is the sustainer of all things, and God should be our goal in all things. If we look at those four verses of Scripture this morning, we see that there is no room for negotiation with God. No room for negotiation with God. As we consider, let's look at verse 33. As we begin to look at verse 33, I want you to first look at the uh, punctuation in that particular verse. It says, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, exclamation point, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, exclamation point. That is not a question. Paul is not asking a question to say, hey, can we really understand the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God? Can we understand his judgments? Are his ways ours to find out? No, it's not in the form of a question. It is an exclamation point. Paul is stating that we cannot understand the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. We say here that his ways are unsearchable, or his ways are past finding out, and his judgments are unsearchable. When we consider who Christ is, think about what we have in Christ. And as we consider ourselves and why we would want to negotiate with God, when we think about negotiating with God, it's as if we're saying, God, we know a little bit more than what you know. We know a little bit more than what you know. And how foolish is that? When we consider the wisdom of God, and we know that that's the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 7 it says, Be not wise in thy own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. In Proverbs chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 it says this, Get wisdom, get understanding. Forget it not, neither to decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 26, it says, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail, to gather and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Consider the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of of God. And when we consider how wise God is, we understand how much we need God. We understand how much we need God. You see, so many times we are considering ourselves to be smarter than God. We consider ourselves to be ones that can figure things out or to say, God, you know what? I have a way that's better. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21 says this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ with passage knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. God knows far better than we know. 
God knows far better than we know. And all it comes down to is where you put your trust. Are you putting your trust in yourself? Because when you put your trust in yourself, you have an ability or a desire, if you will, to begin to negotiate. I know better than you, God. Let me just work this thing out. I can negotiate this thing with you. God is not interested in our negotiation. We need to settle it that of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. The statement says, amen. Enough said. Enough said. There's no need to negotiate with God because he has everything. His unsearchable judgments, his ways past finding out. The riches of his glory simply poured out on the vessels of his mercy. And that's exactly what we are. Just vessels of God's mercy. But as we consider those tips. What makes a good negotiator? What makes a good negotiator? You know one tip of that was. You know what? You got to have a right relationship. If you build a relationship. That's how you're a good negotiator. You know what? The only relationship that matters. Is your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. But I'm convinced there are people who try to negotiate their relationship with God. That's to say, you know what, God? If I do this, this, and this, then surely you'll do this in return. Or God, you know what? I desire to live my life however I want to live my life, but <laughs> as long as I just uh, confess you as my personal Lord and Savior, then everything will be all right. Nothing's further from the truth. We can't negotiate our relationship with God. What does that look like? What does that look like when someone tries to negotiate their relationship with God? Take your Bibles and turn over with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, it says this. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things... Have I observed from my youth? Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. Verse 22. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. What does it look like when you're trying to negotiate your relationship with God? Look at this man here. He comes unto God and he says, Lord, I've done all these things that you mentioned here. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't killed. I haven't stolen. I haven't bear false witness or defrauded anyone. I've honored my father and my mother. So what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have the treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. He went away sad because he had great possessions. But you know what? It goes further than that. Jesus gave him a command. He said, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. There is no negotiation. How can you take up your cross if you've got your hands full of the world's possessions? See, Satan sometimes binds us in a point where we're so full of things that absolutely don't matter that we are not willing to let any of it go to simply take up our cross and follow him. With Jesus, there is no negotiation. He says, all I desire of you is to follow me. All I desire of you is to follow me. And when we follow him, and when we desire to follow him, what's the motive? Why should we? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things who be the glory forever. God has a plan for our life. He just simply says, give it to me. Give me your life. I'll take care of it. I've got all things worked out. I've got all things figured out. Now, as we look in the book of Romans, we see the doctrine of salvation. 
Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, you know, when someone wants to get saved, there's nothing we can do to save an individual, but we can certainly show them from God's word how to be saved. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 reminds us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we see that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no negotiation in that. There's no negotiation in that. But as we consider the one that's saved, what does that look like? What is a person who has salvation? What characteristics or attributes do they have? Go back to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, it says this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. If someone is truly saved, they will not serve sin. No negotiation. No negotiation. Look what else it says in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Let not your sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it or the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of the righteousness of God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from your heart that from the doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. No negotiation. No negotiation. For sin, Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, shall not have dominion over ye, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. You know what the problem is? The problem is people want to negotiate with the Word of God. They want to say, you know what, I am saved, and it's okay to be saved, but I can live and do whatever I want to do. No, you can't. No, you can't, not according to the Word of God. There is no negotiation with God. For of Him and through Him... And to him are all things. Look what it says over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we'll just look at verses 1 through 8. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because of the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. No negotiation. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. But it takes this right back to the rich young ruler. He had so many possessions in his hand on the possessions that he couldn't take up his cross and he couldn't follow after God. A good negotiator is said to be one who has a right relationship, establish a relationship. What is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? Has there been a point in your life that you've confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead? With a heart man believeth unto the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation." For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no negotiation. It's that simple. But have you done it? Have you done it? 
Do you have a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you a negotiator? Is your relationship one that says, you know what, God, I hear those things, but I'm going to kind of don't do my own thing over here. I got things figured out just a little bit better than you, so I'll just kind of cruise through this thing and do my own thing. You know, the second characteristic of a negotiator is one that prefers honey over vinegar. There's nothing that drives me more crazy than to be patronized. Nothing drives me more just crazy than to be patronized. You know how it is. Someone's about to drop the bomb on you, and they come and want to smooth talk you. Oh, look at you. You look sharp today. You look nice today. Man, it's a beautiful day out there. Listen, something I want to talk to you about. (laughs) And then, boom, here it comes. Here it comes. Just come up and say, listen, there's something I want to talk to you about. Forget about what I got on and what the day looks like. You don't want to say that anyway. This is what you want to say. Get it out there and say what you need to say. All throughout the gospel, we see in Matthew and Mark, quoting Isaiah the prophet, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as people draw near to me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. There are people who desire to flatter the Lord, negotiate with him with their smooth talk. Now listen, it's Sunday morning and we're in church. Do we all know how to act and the things we should say in church? Absolutely. Can we all put on our mask and say, hey, I'm going to act like a Christian because I'm in church and that's what's expected of me? Absolutely. But the real test is, who are you outside of these church walls? Who are you outside of these church walls? There is no negotiation with God. Who you are outside of these church walls is who you are, period. You can come in here and you can put on a face and you can act however you want to. You can have all the right right words. You can sue, say, but can I tell you, all you're doing is patronizing a holy God. That's it. That's it. The third skill. Focus on the win-win. Focus on the win-win. Let me ask you this. What do you have to bring to the Lord Jesus Christ? What do you have to bring to the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me ask it a different way. What do you have to bring to God that outweighs the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross for you? What do you have to bring to God? Look what it says there in our passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 11, verse 34. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsel? Does God need our help or our opinion? No, he doesn't. Because of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Yet we somehow think that we can negotiate with God. We somehow think that we have something that can change God's mind. Have you ever been in a situation and approached it like this? Well, God, I see what you're doing over there, but I got a better idea. You know what I say to that better idea? For of him... And through him and to him are all things. God, I see what you did, but I think you should have done this. I say, for of him and through him and to him are all things. God, I want the benefit, but this is how I'm going to go about getting that benefit. Let's negotiate on how I can live the best Christian life. (laughs) For of him... And through him and to him are all things. Verse 35, Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. How foolish. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24 reminds us of this. God made the world and the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, and breath, and things. There is no negotiation with God. There is no negotiation with God. When it comes to your relationship, the only relationship that matters is do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? And when you know him as your personal Lord and Savior, and you have given and yielded your life unto him, guess what? It's going to be evidenced in your actions. It's going to be evidenced in your actions. Not only do we need to look at that relationship, but are you patronizing God? Are you patronizing God with what you're saying? 
All too often we hear this phrase, and it rings so true. People aren't looking at what you say. They're looking at what you do. They're looking at what you do. Same thing holds true with the Lord. We're kidding ourselves to think that we can say one thing and act another way. God is interested in our heart, in the condition of our heart. Focus on the win-win. Why would you focus on the win-win? Focus on what Christ Jesus has done for you. Focus on the fact that he died on the cross for you while you were yet a sinner. And the last two points of a good negotiator, it says, don't argue or provoke or respect the rhythm of the relationship. To that I say, do not frustrate the grace of Christ. Galatians 2, 21. Do not frustrate the grace of Christ. What does it look like? What does it look like? Are you a negotiator? You can't negotiate with God. Look with me over in Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we'll begin reading in verse 14. It says there, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gathered other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gathered beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I had gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he, which had received one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. In other words, what did he begin to do? Let's negotiate this thing. Lord, let's just negotiate this thing here. Verse 25, and I was afraid and went and hid the talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast thine, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathereth where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does it look like? What does it look like when you try to negotiate with God? You see, in our Christian life, we have all been blessed with certain talents. God has given to each of us the ability, if nothing else, to share what Christ has done for us. Just, if nothing else, what Christ has done for us. So what are you doing with that? What are you doing with that? What are you doing with what Christ has given you? Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36 says this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom... And the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him 
are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, as we close this morning, I just want to ask you a couple of questions and just think about things. Are you negotiating with God? Are you negotiating with God? You see, I'd say that there are some here who say, you know what? I've never fully trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I desire a relationship, but I'm looking for the benefits that that brings. Quit looking for the benefits and just make a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. For some of us, we're saying, you know what? I desire to have a better Christian home. I want to make things better than what they are. I want my children to grow up in the admonition of the Lord, yet... Lord, let's negotiate on this thing. I don't really want to read my Bible every day or them see me pray or, you know, really set restrictions or boundaries on them. I mean, that seems kind of crazy. There's no negotiation with the Lord. Lord, I myself want to be a better Christian. I want to be an example for you. I want to have a heart to share what you've done for me. At a minimum, Lord, give me the strength just to share the grace of God that's been shown to my life. Yet when we get out of here, what do we often do? We often let that pass the wayside. We often neglect what Christ would have us to do. There is no negotiation with the Lord. If we want the things of the Lord, we have to follow the precepts of the Lord. No negotiation. If we want the things of God, we have to follow what God has for us. But then we ask ourselves, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't you just want to not negotiate with God? Man, that verse alone, just let that resonate in your mind. And I want you to think about that verse all throughout today. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. You know what? It's a whole lot easier to live right there just trusting the Lord than it is to think we can negotiate with the Lord. I'll sum up with these two verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13 says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Everything else is vanity and vexation of the spirit. In Psalm 138 and verse 8, my closing prayer. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. There is no negotiating with the Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things. Recognize that he created all things. Recognize that he is the sustainer of all things. And make Christ your goal. And stop negotiating with God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we close the message this morning, Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity just to stand in the pulpit and preach your word, Lord. Lord, more importantly than that, I just thank you for the the truths of your word, Lord. First and foremost, just recognizing you desire more than anything for us to have a personal relationship with you. Lord, there are so many benefits to being in Christ Jesus, Lord. All ours for the taking if we'll just simply yield ourselves unto you, Lord. And Lord, for others this morning, Lord, they've been negotiating with the Lord. They've been making bargains and deals with him and saying, Lord, I do want these things, but here's the terms I'm willing to negotiate with you. Lord, may we be reminded that there is no negotiation with you. For of him, through him, and to him are all things. Now, Lord, as we move into the invitation time now, Lord, I just pray that we wouldn't think about the lunch, we wouldn't think about our afternoon, but we would just take just a few minutes, Lord, just to settle in with you. Lord, I just pray that if there's one here and you're speaking to their heart and you're tugging on their heart and they realize, you know what, I've never been saved. I know about the Lord, but I don't have a personal relationship with him. Lord, make today the day of salvation for that soul, Lord. Don't let them walk out of these doors without getting that settled. Lord, for the Christian who may be here this morning, they say, you know what, I've been guilty of negotiating with God and I have to confess personally, Lord, I've been guilty of negotiating with you. Lord, may we come to the point in our life, Lord, when we recognize with you there's no negotiation. There's such freedom in knowing that you know all things.